Well, hello, everybody. Once again, we are back for an exciting talk with Dr. Ronald Brown. Our topic today is rather unique. It's Fifth Avenue. I live in New York City. I live in Queens, but I go to Fifth Avenue all the time. And like most people, you walk up and down. It's a wonderful big urban street. But we tend to forget that Fifth Avenue is more than just a street. It is, in a way, a utopian settlement, an ideal human society. So let's get started. Once again, this is the outline. We'll talk about the emergence of Fifth Avenue from the grid plan of Manhattan, the merchant world of Washington Square. How did Fifth Avenue get started? Who moved there? Third, the rise of a whole new class of Civil War millionaires in the United States, and especially New York. Number four would be the Houses of Worship, central to understanding Fifth Avenue as a ideal, a perfect human society, in a way, a heaven on earth. Point five will be the mansions where the wealthy live. Number six will be private clubs, hanging out with people of their own background. Elite shopping, and finally, monumental buildings. So, why don't we get started? Okay, first and foremost, any human organization has to have some kind of organization. Now, historically, throughout centuries, God organized human society. At the top on the left, we see the emperor of Japan. Well, they claimed he was a descendant from the sun god. He and his imperial family were put on the throne to rule over the islands which God created for this new race of in the middle, we see the rabbis of time of David and Solomon and the ancient uh, Israelites. Society was organized. God called and sanctioned Moses. God called and sanctioned the judges and Saul and David and Solomon and organized a society under their divine and divinely um, sanctioned leadership. At the bottom, we see a soldier. Well, of course, military caste is what keeps the imperial, the royal, the chosen family in power, maintains order in society, and the soldiers form a caste, military caste in any society. In the bottom left corner, we see a merchant, a businessman. Once again, business people are essential for the smooth running of any society. At the top on the right, we see marriage and the family. The family, the nuclear family, the mother and the father and the children with the grandparents, with the great grandparents, the ancestors, the descendants, the family has always been central to a well-regulated society. In ancient times, there was none of these single women running around with half a dozen kids and the men floating in and out, having babies with women all over the place. That leads to the breakdown of society, neglected and abused children. And of course, at the bottom of every society, the bottom right-hand picture is we see slaves. Slavery was an essential part of every ancient society. When King David conquered Jerusalem he, from the Jebusites, he slaughtered all the adults and sold all the children as slaves. Uh, slavery in the United States was a major institution and it was enshrined in the Constitution, supported by laws. So whether you are the emperor at the top or a slave at the bottom, a member of the military caste, a member of the business class, a member of the holy 
class of priests, uh, or you were a member of a clan or a family. All of these were instrumental in creating a well-regulated society. And generally religions sanctioned this or hierarchical organization of society. You look at Hinduism on the left, you see the Brahmins, the priests, followed by the warriors and kings, the merchants and landowners, the bottom, the commoners, the peasants and servants. And of course, these were the un bottom, were the untouchable, the outcasts, those who had no status in the society. And on the right, we see Confucianism. Up is the emperor with his, underneath that, the court, the nobles, the government officials. Then the peasants, the artisans, and the merchants towards the bottom. And of course, the slaves at the bottom. So any well-regulated society has a hierarchy. It has people at the top and it has people at the bottom. As St. Paul said, the poor you will always have with you. And implying also that you will always have leaders, you will have followers. You will always have peasants toiling the land. You will always have business people. And you will always have the lowest class. And so religions have recognized that a well-organized hierarchy, a pyramid, those at the top and those at the bottom, is a part of every stable society. The United States, unfortunately, uh, didn't really have uh, much of a society in the colonial period. If you look at the map on the top, we see the original 13 colonies. Well, there were these radical Puritans up in New England, you had the Amish in Pennsylvania, the Presbyterians hanging out in New Jersey, the Dutch Reformed, of course, controlled New York, Catholics in Maryland, in the South, you had English, whites, you had a huge slave population, sort of total chaos. And of course, in the early decades of the country, more and more immigrants came in. Irish Catholics flooded into the cities. German Lutherans and Catholics and Jews flooded in, spreading everywhere and everywhere. So the United States really was sort of total chaos as all these people flooded in. Well, there was a diversity of race, of language, of culture, of religion. And the big challenge was how do you create a stable society out of all of this mess of people. And it got even worse. While the Civil War, you had millions of Italians, you had the Jews from Eastern Europe, Russians and Hungarians, and today you have Chinese and Mexicans and Africans and Muslims and every other kind of people pouring in. Well, Israel Zangville, an Englishman, invented the name melting pot the title of his famous uh, play. Well, he described America as a big pot. All these immigrants are coming in and they would melt and become a mass. But out of this mass of human beings, you had to create a stable society. I mean, every society needed leaders at the top, slaves at the bottom, and everything in between, a clergy class, a merchant class, farming class, an intellectual class, all of these had to emerge from this giant pot of boiling people. So the United States had a job ahead of, its, of itself, how to create a stable, long-lasting country, society out of this mass of melted individuals, ethnic groups, religious groups, racial groups, cultural groups, language, everything else all messed up together. So that was the challenge of the early United States. Well, this creation of an elite 
class in America, an aristocracy, as they had in Europe and in every country since time immemorial, was the challenge. So Fifth Avenue became central to the emergence of this aristocracy. Now, at the bottom left, we see New Amsterdam, which was the Dutch town, founded in 1624, and remained Dutch 1664. We see the uh, wall going up and down in the picture. That is today Wall Street, because it was the city wall. And going right and left, the big street is what is today Broadway. Well, the English took over in 1664 and ruled it until 1776 when the revolution broke out. Well, they simply went beyond the wall and built a whole new English city, gradually spreading up Broadway, filling in areas between the Hudson River and the East River, building new settlements, absorbing new immigrants, more and more people being dumped into this melting pot. Well, the person who really shaped the new emerging city was one of our greatest mayors and governors, DeWitt Clinton. As the name implies, DeWitt, he was half Dutch. Clinton, he was half English mixture of the old Dutch who had built the city and then the English who took over. Well, he devoted his life from member of the New York legislature, 1798, right after the American Revolution, until 1828, when he died as governor. Except for one year, 1802 to three, when he was in Washington as a senator, well, he didn't last too long there. He said, I'm wasting my time in this new city of Washington. I'm a New Yorker. I am going to build a great new city. Well, his two largest and most important accomplishments in New York was the City Hall, which you see on the left, which was finished in 1811, and his famous grid plan of 1807. This is the avenues going north and south and the streets going east and west. This was his accomplishment. And he didn't just make this pretty map, which you can see, but he had surveyors go through and lay out the streets and the avenues. Well, his critics said, my God, New York City is a small town at the bottom of Manhattan. Look at the map on the right. You see the dark area. That was New York that uh, DeWitt Clinton knew. The rest was just hills and wild animals and Indians and a couple farms, but nothing of major importance except for a couple villages like Greenwich Village and Harlem way up in the north and a couple of other places. When they criticize him saying, spending all this money on this magnificent giant city, all in marble and gilded um, statues and everything, and this map, which was totally unnecessary, why were you spending all of the city's money on this? Rudy Witt Clinton looked them in the eye and said, mark my word, one day New York City will have a population of a million. Well, everybody laughed, said, my God, a million. I mean, even London and Paris, uh, they are the major cities. Dumpy little New York will never amount to too much. But he stuck to his guns and said, the city will one day be the greatest city in the world. Don't forget, it was George Washington who said New York was the empire city. And DeWitt Clinton clearly believed that, that was what the city was destined to be. Well, when he laid out the grid plan, there was no um, Central Park or anything. In fact, most people never even went up that far north. They were limited to the lower edge of uh, Manhattan. Well, 
there was one area which was a potter's field. Potter's field is where they buried people who had no money or they didn't know who they were. Drunk was found on the street, dead. They would bury him in a potter's field. There was also an elm tree there that they used to hang criminals. And by 1926, it was used as a military parade ground where the National Guard would meet and go around marching and practice shooting. 1827, the area was turned into a public park. Well, interesting, as the new avenues started taking shape, the avenues going north and south, there was one avenue that ended up at Washington Square and it died. If you look at the map on the right, you see Washington Square as it looks today, and you see Fifth Avenue coming down and stopping at Washington Square. Well, if you were going to go north to south as the city grew, you avoided Fifth Avenue because it was a dead end. So you'd take one of the other avenues that would go from the north down to the city back and forth. And so Fifth Avenue was sort of a neglected uh, avenue with no major importance. Well, the city started growing. As you can see in the population, time of the revolution, 25,000. Under DeWitt Clinton, it was over 100,000, approaching uh, 200,000 by the time he died. By the Civil War, 1860, it was well over a million. So the city was growing, attracting millions of Irish immigrants, German immigrants, and as well as English and Irish and Scottish. Well, the well-to-do people, these were the old landowner families, the old Knickerbocker families. In New York, a Knickerbocker is someone who can trace his family back to the colonial area. These were the Dutch, the French Huguenots, the early Germans, the English and the Scots. Names like Stuyvesant, Livingston, Rhinelander, Roosevelt, Delancey, Fish, Pintard, Beekman, Jay, and a host of others. These were the old families. Just like DeWitt Clinton was a mixture of Dutch and English. So gradually these families intermarried, keeping the money in the same clique of people, the same clans, and they started emerging as a distinct group of people called the New York Knickerbockers. Well, some of the more famous names were John Jacob Astor, son of a butcher from Germany, came over with absolutely nothing, made money in the beaver fur trade, went into real estate, and when he died in 1829, he was the richest man in the country. A.T. Stewart, another person who came over, opened up department stores, died very wealthy. The Jones family from out at Jones Beach, they were another big family and they were very important because they always knew what was the latest wine being drunk in Paris. What was the latest fashion for men's coats in England? That's where we get the phrase keeping up with the Joneses. The Rhinelander family was famous for dominating the sugar, molasses, and rum trade. Stuyvesant family, great landowners. The Roosevelt family owned land. James Lennox was in business. And these constituted a class of people called the old Knickerbocker families. Well, as the city was being swamped, by Irish Catholics who couldn't even speak English and were uneducated and illiterate farmers, or German immigrants who couldn't even speak English and who had no high culture. The old Knickerbocker families decided that the time had come for them to start moving into one area of the city and establishing their ethnic neighborhood. Now in New York, we're used to the little Italy's where all the Italians live. 
we're used to Chinatowns, we're used to uh, other neighborhoods where the Mexicans live or whether the Dominicans live, uh, the Lower East Side Jewish neighborhood. We know all these ethnic neighborhoods. But we tend to re don't realize that the rich people also decided to build their neighborhood with all of the infrastructure of an ethnic neighborhood. So they decided to take over this new Washington Square area. And they started building their houses. And today you see along the northern row of Washington Square, these red brick buildings, three floors tall, three windows wide, with a stoop going up the steps and going in. Stoop is an old Dutch word. The fronts were very simple. There's no gold, there's no statue, there are no monuments, maybe some plants and that, but that's about all simplicity in architecture. On the right, you see some of the older buildings, which were very simple, red brick or brownstone, no ornaments. And these old Dutch and English and an admixture of German and Scottish ended up intermarrying, moving to Washington Square, and claiming it as their ethnic neighborhood. The architecture they adopted was what we call federal architecture. Here again, the typical brownstone. Three windows wide, a stoop going up to the front door, very little decoration around the windows, very simple. A door going down into the basement where the kitchens were, the laundry rooms, where the cooks and the washing woman did all of their work, and the family lived upstairs. So these were one family houses, well to do families. They may be filthy rich, old Dutch knickerbockers or English knickerbockers, but they were modest, simple architects. Well, as soon as they started taking over Washington Square, of course, if you're going to have an ethnic neighborhood, an elite neighborhood of the ruling class, of course, you had to have your churches. And so they built first, we see in 1840, the New South Dutch Reformed Church for all the Dutch people, nice Gothic architecture. On the right, going up Fifth Avenue at 12th Street, the first Presbyterian church for the Presbyterians from Scotland. The Dutch church is no longer there, but the first Presbyterian church is still one of the most ancient and um, beautiful churches along Fifth Avenue, if not in New York. Now, they thank God for their success. They prayed that God would continue to bless them with their financial success and prosperity. They also built a new university. It is called NYU today. Uh, it was the Presbyterian University, staffed by Dutch and Scottish and English Protestants. In fact, all of the first presidents from 1831 to 1881 were all reverends. They were all preachers in either the Dutch or the Scottish churches. So it was really a little holy land in the middle of a New York City being overrun by Irish Catholics and Germans and later Italians and Jews and all kinds of other strange people. So they staked out a neighborhood for their elite use. A little bit further up, they built an Episcopal Church of the Ascension, 1841, which is still standing. Now, the churches that the Scotch and the Dutch built were simple, just like their houses were covered with gold and marble and statues and everything. The churches also were very simple, very plain. For example, there were no stained glass windows with pictures of Jesus and Mary and the saints. 
On the right, we see a typical church window. No figures, not even any plants, nothing to distract you from worship. Many of the churches had no church organ. If there was music, you would simply sing. There was no altar. In the middle of the front was a pulpit, and you can see at the bottom was, was a stand with an open Bible. It was all about reading the Bible. And there were no statues or paintings or decorations to distract you from worship. So this New York City elite, this aristocracy that was emerging, was deeply rooted in religion. They were followers of John Calvin, who lived in Geneva and founded many religious movements. In Scotland, they, they're called the Presbyterians. In Holland, they're called the Dutch Reformed Church. In England, the Puritans. In Germany, the Reformed Germans. In France, the Huguenots. And they believed that if you worked hard, you went to church, you lived a good life, God would reward you with material prosperity, meaning you would get rich, which was very important because they are also saying, if you're poor, you are a bad person. You don't go to church on Sunday. You don't pray to God. You don't study the Bible. You are not a good person. You drink alcohol. You gamble. You play cards. You go to the theater. You're sleeping with other people's wives. So if you live a good Christian Calvinist life, you don't play cards, you don't drink alcohol, you don't go dancing, you don't wear wild clothes or build big beautiful monuments to live in. If you live this kind of a strict life, God will bless you with prosperity. So the emerging New York City elite aristocracy firmly believed that they were chosen by God. They were blessed by God. Now, this philosophy of Calvinism leading to hard work, serious life, and prosperity was described in the book by Max Weber called The Protestant Ethic, or The Protestant Way of Life and the Spirit of Capitalism live a good serious life, stick with your family, go to church on Sunday, don't drink, don't play cards, don't go to theater, don't live a wild life, and God will bless you. Here in this world, you don't have to wait to get to heaven to have happiness. You can have it here in this world. Now, writers praise this wonderful world of Washington Square. For example, you have Henry James, who wrote a book entitled Washington Square, The Lifestyle of the People. Um, Edith Wharton wrote a book on old New York, how they celebrated New Year's Day. Don't forget for the old Dutch and uh, English Protestants of New York, Christmas was illegal because December 25th is nowhere to be found in the Bible. So Christmas is not a Christian holiday. But they did celebrate New Year's, but that's not a religious holiday, not in the Bible, and you're not celebrating anything religious. You're just celebrating the beginning of a new year. So this wonderful world of Washington Square was highly praised. Well, everything seemed to be going pretty good with Washington Square growing, attracting the old Knickerbocker families, gradually pushing up Fifth Avenue, which was a dead end, so nobody used it, so they could build their mansions, build their churches, and expand peacefully up Fifth Avenue. Prices were so exorbitant for real estate that only rich people could live there. And who were the rich in New York? the Dutch and the English, and to an extent, the French and the German aristocrats. 
Well, things began to change by the mid-1800s, when you had a whole new group of people who were getting rich. And these were not old Knickerbockers, they were new immigrants. Henry Steinway was a German who migrated. Uh, his real name was Heinrich Steinweg. Migrated to New York, started building pianos. During the Civil War, he made cannons and railroads and guns and, and swords and became very wealthy. We all know Steinway in Queens is where his factories were. He was a new arrival to Fifth Avenue. A.T. Stewart migrated from Northern Ireland, and he said, why should the New Yorkers go around one stop at a hat stop store, another one to the butcher, another to the baker, another to the suit maker, another to the shoemaker, saying this is absolutely a ridiculous way of shopping. So he gathered all of these little stores, put them under one roof in one big building, and it was the very first department store. Well, during the Civil War, so many people made so much money. War is good for business. So all of the rich families were starting to go to the A.T. Stewart department store, and he became, like Henry Steinway, a multi-millionaire because of the Civil War. Cornelius Vanderbilt, he was an old Dutch family going way back, but he was a simple farmer in New Dorp in Staten Island. Well, when the Civil War came, he saw that there was a need for getting all of his fruits and vegetables and meat from his farms and other farms getting them to the big marketplaces of New York, which was booming. So he started building boats and hiring boats and renting boats. And pretty soon he had an entire fleet of ships taking food from Staten Island and New Jersey into the city. So he started calling himself Commodore, like he was the captain of a giant ship or something. Well, of course, he was another one who became filthy wealthy. And eventually, he moved his family from Staten Island to Washington Square and gradually started building mansions for his children and grandchildren on Fifth Avenue. And in the middle at the bottom, you see the mansion that he built. Now, this is no longer a simple uh, building like you see on the left, the simple houses of Washington Square. This was a giant mansion in gold and uh, marble. But that's the kind of new people who were moving in to Fifth Avenue. Now these were called gilded people. This was the gilded age following the Civil War. Gilded in modern English we would say something is gold-plated. Gilded means gold on the outside, but don't ask what was underneath it. Just like John Jacob Astor and Cornelius Vanderbilt, they were simple, ordinary uh, meat and potatoes and beer people, suddenly become filthy rich. So these were the new group of people moving on to Fifth Avenue. Now, of course, not everybody was happy having these newcomers on the old Knickerbocker Fifth Avenue, but money attracts money. The Vanderbilt started intermarrying with the Stuyvesants and the Fish and the uh, other old Dutch and English families and the German uh, Astors married Vanderbilts and everybody else. And gradually a new elite was emerging, which was broader than the old Knickerbockers, but again, based on money. If you could afford to build a house or a mansion on Fifth Avenue, then you were considered the first step towards becoming a member of the aristocracy. Other families made it big during the Civil War. The Warburgs were very Jewish family from Germany, very big in the slave trade, the cotton trade, gradually moved to New York, and 
became one of the most wealthiest banking families, again controlling cotton import and export. Andrew Carnegie moved from Scotland, where he's born in a stone house and no significance, moved to Pittsburgh, made a fortune in iron and steel, and then ended up moving to New York Fifth Avenue, where the American elite was growing. J.P. Morgan, another Scottish immigrant, made it big in the banking industry. So a whole new group of very wealthy people were moving to Fifth Avenue. Well, of course, as a new group moved to the avenue, of course, their first goal was to thank God for blessing them with money. You see, say Thomas Episcopal Church. Episcopalians are from England. This is the second church on the spot. First one built right after the Civil War. It was torn down and this new one is built. Fifth Avenue Presbyterian. Presbyterians from Scotland. Again, thanking God for keeping them wealthy, for blessing their hard and their serious work. So more and more houses of worship started growing up on Fifth Avenue. The Irish who came over in the 1830s and 40s because of the potato famine gradually started rising in the social scale. Dagger John, Archbishop John Hughes, organized the Irish, whipped them into shape, built schools, universities, hospitals, convents, orphanages, and drug the Irish from the old St. Patrick's, which you see in the middle of the picture, surrounded by the wall, and built his new monumental St. Patrick's Cathedral on Fifth Avenue to tell the world that the Irish were now part of the American aristocracy. The German Jews started off in Lower East Side. You see the picture at the bottom, a storefront. In the 1840s, a German Jews organized their first synagogue, got organized. After the Civil War, they had made so much money and had such success that they could build their very first Fifth Avenue synagogue, which is in the upper left with the big domes and everything. That was eventually torn down and they moved further north and built the current Temple Emmanuel. So the German Jews, these were the Warburgs, the Bloombergs, the Koch family, the great wealthy German Jewish family that once again had made a fortune during the Civil War through hard work and took their place on the avenue of the aristocrats, Fifth Avenue. Now, in addition to churches, of course, and synagogues, if you are of the elite, you build your mansion, you live in your ethnic neighborhood. Well, times were changing. When it was the old Dutch and English Knickerbockers, they were happy with their simple brownstones that you see in the picture on the left. But gradually, the new rich, the gilded people, had so much money that they decided to start living like the European, the French and the English and the German and the Italian and Spanish aristocrats. So they started building big, beautiful mansions, no longer in brownstone and brick, but in marble. No longer simple, but the A.T. Stewart mansion at the bottom with its mansard roof the sloping roof, which gave it a French elegance with balconies and pillars and decorations on the corners. And the inside, we won't even mention, filled with statues and fountains and paintings, all brought over from Europe. So Fifth Avenue became a place of luxurious, glorious marble mansions. Commodore Vanderbilt, who started out with his ships, taking carrots and potatoes from Staten Island to Manhattan, 
ended up taking over the railroads, forming a monopoly, and becoming the richest man in the country. Well, of course, he was going to take over Fifth Avenue. And at the bottom, you see two of the mansions of the Vanderbilt family. And further up the street in the distance, you see the house mansion of the head of the Vanderbilt family. Whenever one of his family members would get married, the first thing he did was build them a Fifth Avenue mansion. And of course, it was elegant, sometimes an entire block filled with gold and furniture from Europe. The Warburg clan built this giant mansion on the right on Fifth Avenue. You can see it, it looks like a castle from the Loire Valley in France with decorations and marble and interior with gilded uh, uh, furniture and decorations. Today, this is the Jewish Museum. The Warburg clan was the wealthiest Jewish family in New York after the Civil War. Andrew Carnegie said, well, it's all right to make a fortune in Pittsburgh, but you're nobody until you have a mansion in New York City. And so you had the Andrew Carnegie mansion. J.B. Duke, the tobacco king from South and North Carolina, built his giant mansion. Once again, this is no brownstone or red brick, a modest building. But this is a Fifth Avenue mansion of an aristocrat. A woman who made it big was Madame Rastel, who was a British immigrant, arrived with nothing. And of course, during the Civil War, money was to be had. Business was good. So with all these young soldiers, 17, 18, 19 years old, coming to New York for training and then marching off to war, well, she recognized that these nice young boys needed to have some fun before they marched off to war. So she was the queen of prostitution. Well, of course, a lot of women got pregnant. And so to have a restellion was her way of having an abortion. She invented condoms. She be built this house at the bottom. Once again, a mansion, one, two, three, four floors, big, beautiful mansion right on Fifth Avenue, the richest self-made woman in New York. Well, of course, for a lot of people, her business of prostitution and abortion and condoms and all that kind of stuff was not really very reputable. And she was not really admitted to the Fifth Avenue aristocratic club. And in despair, she slit her wrists in her bathtub in her mansion. The book on the right, Madame Restel the Abortionist, the wickedest woman in New York. But this was the spirit. You got money, you built a Fifth Avenue mansion, and you aspired to join the American and the New York City aristocratic class. Now, another very important part of the rising aristocrats was joining a private club. Now, already in 1836, the Union Club had been founded with its beautiful clubhouse. 1871, right after the Civil War, the Knickerbocker Club was founded. Now, these were private clubs, men's only, of course. Uh, inside the club, there would be a couple restaurants, a bar, a billiard room, a newspaper reading room, a ballroom for big events, uh, all kinds of other activities. The top floor would have rooms so that if you had friends who were visiting, uh, they could stay at your club. So clubbing was really a sign of the aristocrats. Now, of course, you couldn't apply to join one of these clubs. You had to be invited by members and approved by the members. And they went over every detail. 
were you ever divorced? Was it known if you were messing around with other women or men? What was your financial background like? Are you the kind of person they would want in your club? Because the worst thing possible would be a scandal. So you would receive a letter inviting you to visit the club. You would be interviewed. You would be allowed in the club, invited to events, everybody watching everything. What were your table manners like? When you got a menu in French, would you read it? When you were asked what wine would you prefer with this particular meal, did you know your French, your Spanish, and your Portuguese wines? Were you dressed in the latest London fashions of that year? Was your wife wearing the latest fashions from Paris? What perfume did she use? Was she of the quality that the Knickerbocker Club or the Union Club would want? Right after the Civil War, the famous Harvard Club was founded for graduates of Harvard. Now, of course, in 1865, uh, no Jews, no Blacks, no Catholics, uh, no women were at Harvard Club. It was the aristocratic club of the aristocrats. I go there every year for the big Christmas party since I am a Harvard uh, alum. And I mean, it is a world within a world. Well, of course, Jews couldn't join any of these clubs. Even if they did have a mansion on Fifth Avenue and were filthy rich, it was still not the kind of person a good club would want. So what did the Jews do? In 1852, they established their own club. Now, these were not just ordinary Jews. These were highly educated, very wealthy German reform Jews. None of these black hats and and side curls and strings on your t-shirt uh, uh, type of uh, member in their club. They were as uh, racist as anybody else was at the time. Only good quality German speaking Jews. That's why the name until today is the Harmony Club, but spelt in the German way with an IE at the end. The original name was Gesellschaft Harmony. One of the most fascinating clubs which boomed after the Civil War was, of course, the New York Yacht Club. The picture on the left shows one of the windows of the club, which is just off of Fifth Avenue in the middle of Manhattan, the back end of a sailing ship. In the middle picture, you see models of every kind of ship ever built with its fireplace, its reading room, its library, a club of the elite. Now, of course, to join the New York Yacht Club, um, you had to have a yacht. And to maintain a yacht with all of the staff could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, a year. And of course, my yacht is bigger than your yacht. I have a brand new yacht this year. You still have one that's two years old. The clubhouse is on the right, which is up in Newport, Rhode Island. And that's where the owners of yacht, the elite, would gather and mingle. Once again, this was a playground for the wealthy. Now, you could have a yacht and you could sail, but if you were not of the right quality of person, you would not be asked to join the New York Yacht Club. Now, these clubs still exist. And in fact, an interesting experience is when some old multimillionaire or an old family person of New York dies, and they have the obituary in the New York Times, very often they will list the clubs that that person was a member of, which meant he had the approval of all of the right clubs. 
Now, sometimes there will be no membership listed, which were meant that they were not a member of the New York aristocrats. So club membership was a major um, feature of the aristocracy. Now, once you were in the aristocracy, you'd be a member of a yacht club and everything, but if you had a divorce, or your daughter got pregnant and had an illegitimate baby out of marriage, this could be grounds for shunning, even exclusion from a club. For the aristocrats, the family was sacred. This is no single women with 15 babies, each one with a different man. These were women who were married, of good stock, well-educated, even if the husband was messing around, it was kept out of the newspapers. A scandal could have you expelled from the New York aristocracy in five minutes. And you would know if you were being expelled. You would not receive an invitation to a big party at the Yacht Club. You would not be invited to the Christmas party of an Astor or a Stuyvesant. So it was an aristocracy like in Europe, but without crowns. And over time, new people could join and people could fall out and disappear. Now, of course, women were excluded from all the clubs, but of course, what did the German Jews do? Well, you're excluded, you found your own club. So we had the aristocracy gathering in the um, Cosmopolitan Club on the left, which has their clubhouse, the Colony Club on, over on Park Avenue. Um, once again, very important for women. Women were crucial to the aristocracy. Very often it was the women who organized a get together between one family's very eligible, Harvard educated, very wealthy and charming man, young man, and the young girl from another family, also highly educated and producing, ready to produce a new generation of aristocrats. And so it was a way of keeping money in the family. Sometimes it was intermarriage uh, two or three times between two families. Um, 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 Eleanor Roosevelt was a Roosevelt before she got married. I think it was a second cousin. Two branches of the same family, FDR branch and Eleanor Roosevelt branch got married, and so she became Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt, pure Roosevelt blue blood on both sides. Now, many well-to-do women, and especially their mothers, pushed their very eligible, very beautiful daughters to look for a European husband. Because the only thing that escaped the American aristocrats of Fifth Avenue was a royal title. The American Constitution forbid, it made it illegal to have a royal title, to use a royal title, and to remain an American citizen. This was our democratic tradition. So when an extremely wealthy young girl uh, on the left, we see Consuelo Vanderbilt Balson from the Vanderbilt family. When she married into the family of Winston Churchill, she gave up her citizenship, but she became a duchess or a princess. Many went to Russia where they became grand duchess. And these were the million dollar American princesses. And that was really the only thing that the New York Fifth Avenue aristocrats were never able to capture. There was never a baron or a duke or a prince or a king or an emperor among the New York aristocrats. They had to leave Fifth Avenue to achieve this success. Well, 
it was really not that difficult because if your daddy was a Vanderbilt and had billions of dollars, he could go over and find some duke or earl or even a prince in Europe who had the title, ancient family, but no money. His castle was falling down. So the Vanderbilt brought a suitcase filled with millions of dollars, restored the castle, and in exchange, she became a duchess or a marquise or even a princess. Well, another aspect of the emerging Fifth Avenue or aristocracy was elite shopping. Gold and furs and diamonds. Till today, Fifth Avenue is the street of luxurious shopping. Brooks Brothers, which was established way back in 1818, gentlemen's clothing boomed during the Civil War. In fact, they made the uniforms for the generals and admirals in Washington. In fact, George Wash uh, uh, um, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in a Brooks Brothers coat. Saks Fifth Avenue, right after the Civil War, another big department store, shows that you didn't have to call it anything other than Saks Fifth Avenue, meaning Fifth Avenue had the charm. It had the elegance that everybody expected. Like the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, it didn't have to be St. Paul's Church or St. Peter's Church. It was the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. Tiffany and Company, since 1837, became the largest producer of elegant jewelry, house furnishings, carpets, clothing for this elite. So you had the higher group of people who catered to the whims and the money of the elite. Char um, Harry Winston, my good friend, who used to stay at the same hotel as I did in Geneva. The uh, difference was I was working there and he was staying there, the Hotel Richemont in Geneva, where he would come to do his diamond shopping in Geneva. I remember once we were talking, it was late at night. I was the night porter, as they call it, the chasseur de nuit at l'Hotel Richemont. And one day he came in and we sat down in the lobby. And it was my job just to be friendly. So we were talking and he took out a diamond from his pocket and said, you ever see one of these? And it was, my God, the size of a baseball. And uh, I took it in my hand and he said, oh yeah, I just bought it. And he told me how many millions of dollars he had spent on that diamond. And here it was just tucked in his pocket, walking around the streets of uh, New York City. Well, diamonds were a girl's best friend, but they also were the decoration of girls on Fifth Avenue. The bottom, you see the famous uh, 47th Street, which is until today, the Diamond District of New York, appropriately placed on the street of the aristocrats with their crowns and diamonds and jewels right on the same street. Um, uh, the other stores along FAO Schwartz, here again, the largest toy store in the world until just recently. The building in the top right is one of the old one of the few Fifth Avenue mansions which is still standing. That is the Cartier store now. And you can see that it was an elegant building. Um, uh, and it, was how it housed one family, the Plant family, who had moved to Fifth Avenue, built their mansion in the very early 1900s, uh, one, of the old, one of the newer mansions along there but it still remains. The building on the right of that mansion, the white building, that was the last of the Vanderbilt mansions built for one of the daughters of the Commodore, I believe. Uh, and that was part of the Vanderbilt row. That's, those are the two few mansions still standing on um, 
Fifth Avenue. Picture in the middle, that is the, um, uh, that's the Tiffany uh, building today. You can see um, with all of the um, decorations and everything. Rockefeller Center, built during the Depression, became one of the glories of Fifth Avenue. Once again, typical New York, if you achieve fame and glory and join the aristocracy, you put your name on your building. So we have Rockefeller Center built by the Rockefeller family by John D. Rockefeller Jr. Himself, covered with sculptures, the famous ice skating rink, the famous, uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, the famous um, Rockefeller Christmas tree is there. On the right, you see the tallest skyscraper, and that's the top of the rock where you have a magnificent restaurant. This was one of the jewels of uh, Fifth Avenue, covered with sculptures, uh, golden statues, or golden painted. That's what you call gilded, meaning it's a statue, God knows what it's made of, maybe cement or metal, but it's covered with a beautiful layer of gold. Another ornament to Fifth Avenue in honor of the Rockefeller family. Now, monumental buildings, both private and public, have their place on Fifth Avenue, not just Rockefeller Center, which is a monumental cluster of, I believe, 17 or 18 buildings linked underground with tunnels and subways. It's its own zip code uh, with its own subway station and a post office. But many other public monumental structures have adorned Fifth Avenue. Here we see the famous Washington Square Arch. Well, that was built um, to celebrate the memory of, of course, George Washington. The original one on the right, you can see with the horses and carriages and stuff, was made out of wood and a big parade in honor of George Washington was held uh, that marched up and down Fifth Avenue through the arch. Well, it was so popular that the city decided to build a similar arch, but this one out of stone. And it was built at the northern part of, Fifth, of Washington Square. You can see behind it on the right, some of the red brick uh, federal architectural buildings. But you walk through the arch and you look north, that is the grand entrance to Fifth Avenue. On the corner is number one, Fifth Avenue. So it really celebrated Fifth Avenue as the street of the aristocrats. You enter through the monumental arch and you enter another world, a world which we can only look at and visit, but not inhabit. Another monumental construction along Fifth Avenue was, of course, Central Park, begun shortly before the Civil War, constructed during the Civil War. You see the lake at the bottom at uh, 96th Street, where um, first part of the park to open, organ um, built and designed by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox. Well, during the Civil War, the city of New York was just rolling in money. So many fortunes were made that the wealthy insisted on expanding the park further and further and further north. And so it finally reached 110th Street. And here we see one of the gates where you see the scholar's gate at the bottom. That's the one I always go in when I take uh, people on walking tours, walks into the zoo and up through the park. Here again, this was very important for the aristocracy. In Europe, there were giant glorious parks, but there were always the backyard of some king's castle which the king would open periodically 
for well-dressed aristocrats to stroll through. Well, New York didn't have any Marquis of Manhattan to build the park. So they banded together to build an elegant park which would glor uh, rival the great parks of the Jardin Luxembourg, the Tuileries, and the other great parks of Europe. Now, of course, when it was opened, uh, it was uh, a very strictly controlled. You see at the bottom, you see the Scholar's Gate. That's one of the gates. There was a policeman there to make sure everyone was appropriately dressed. It was also closed on Sundays which meant you were supposed to be in church on Sundays, not strolling in the park. So the ordinary person who worked six days a week from eight in the morning until seven or eight could never visit the park. So it was a playground for the wealthy. As the picture at the bottom shows, well-to-do families in their sleighs, ice skating, strolling around the park in summer and winter. It was designed by the rich for the rich to imitate the European aristocracy. Metropolitan Museum, shortly after the Civil War, was organized and gradually built where you see the present building. Once again, the European kings had built and financed the parks and the museums, but in New York, it was the wealthy. So philanthropy became a very important part of the aristocracy, giving money. Now, of course, this is typical New York philanthropy. You gave a million dollars to the museum, you sure wanted your name to be plastered all over the place. So Donald Trump didn't invent anything new, not that he gives money to anything, but he plasters his name on his famous Fifth Avenue Trump Tower, which was a very, very old tradition. New York Public Library, another monumental public building with the two lions, uh, Patience and Fortitude. I always forget which one is which a giant reading room by Carrier and Hastings, great architect of New York, and filled with the books collected by the wealthy of New York. The James Lennox collection is there. The Astor Library brought its books there. And they're all remembered and commemorated in statues and engravings. Some wealthy people would um, donate entire branches of the library, which until today bear their name. Another monumental public building is, of course, the Flatiron, which is at the intersection of Broadway, Fifth Avenue, and 32nd Street. I love the picture on the left when you look at this magnificent skyscraper. And then you look down at the bottom and you see horses and buggies roaming around shows a transition from the age of horse and buggy to the age of electric elevators and skyscrapers. Really one of the monumental buildings of New York City. Once again, appropriately placed on Fifth Avenue. Other famous buildings include the Plaza Hotel uh, up at 96th Street with its famous Palm Court. Hotels were very important because that is where the great weddings took place. The great um, family events took place in the hotels. The dining rooms were in the hotels with some of the greatest chefs from Europe. The Empire State Building, built during the Great Depression, also on Fifth Avenue, one of the treasures of uh, Fifth Avenue, again, celebrating New York as the Empire City and New York State as the Empire State, a name given to the city and the state by, of course, George Washington. And until today, famous buildings are being built on Fifth Avenue, not just the Trump Tower and other skyscraper buildings, but 
the monumental Guggenheim Museum. Once again, a very wealthy family plastering its name all over everything, but hey, that's New York. That's the American aristocrats. 1959 by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, unique architecture, spiral, saying I was going to change the way New York and the world looks. No square boxes in my buildings, no square and rectangular shapes anywhere. It is going to be an organic shape. So Fifth Avenue continues to be the homeland of the New York aristocrats. Of course, it's ever changing. Today we're having Chinese and Hispanics and Russians and Africans and Middle Easterners moving to the city, all aspiring to membership in the good clubs, all aspiring to aristocratic um, status in New York all aspiring to marry into the right families. So the New York aristocrats, the New York elite, basically recreated from scratch, from the rooting around in the melting pot, rooting around with all of the immigrants coming in, recreated the aristocratic society of Europe. And even more than Europe, this is the aristocratic society, the layered society where you have um, um, an upper class, you have a lower class, you have classes in the middle where everybody knows their place. You know who is an aristocrat. You know who is an ordinary middle class blue collar worker. So even though we have a unique American approach to the aristocracy. Still, we recreate it. It's sort of as if you take any group of people, dump them on the moon, within a generation or two, we would have recreated the hierarchical society. Whether it's the emperor or the king or God at the top, every level of society is recreated. So I call in uh, many of my lectures this um, importance of hierarchy in a society. I refer to those as one of the universal building blocks of all religions and of all societies, where you have the top and the bottom and everything in between. It leads to a stable society. It leads to a society where people know their place. In the American case, you can always aspire to rise up, as many people have, but you can also fall down and lose your status. And so from all of these mixture of people, the old building block of a hierarchical society was recreated. And this became a distinctive feature of American society. And Fifth Avenue became the abode of the aristocrats of America. So that brings us to an end of another exciting talk. Once again, uh, you can see on the left, um, uh, that's me. Um, walking around New York on the right, you see the uh, Plaza uh, Hotel. On the left, that's me in front of the New York Public Library, two of the major landmarks of the aristocratic elite of New York City. So if anybody has any comments or any issues that they would like to uh, bring to my attention, uh, please feel free to send me an email to ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. And I will be thrilled to have your contributions, uh, criticisms, additions, and uh, answer any questions which you might have. So once again, thank you very much for joining me in this talk. And I hope to see you in the near future. Thank you very much. Goodbye.